Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we talked about heat and work, and we mentioned that they're both forms of energy transfer in a system. Last time, we looked at work a little, and we talked about how the work done during a process can be calculated. Today, I want to talk a little about heat and how it's measured. As we'll see, heat can be a tricky property to measure, but it's absolutely crucial to our understanding of the energy transfer that occurs during any chemical process, from combustion to digestion. But how do we measure this? The device we use is called a calorimeter. The very first calorimeter was invented by Antoine Lavoisier and Pierre-Simon Laplace. Lavoisier was interested in improving farming practices in 18th century France. One of the things he studied was how efficient different kinds of livestock feed are. If you have several different types of grain you could feed your cows, which ones would give your cows the most energy? Here's how he did that experiment. This is a picture of the calorimeter Lavoisier and Laplace invented. You can see in this cutaway that there are three chambers, one inside the other. The outer chamber was filled with a mixture of water and ice. The reason for that is that, as you might know, ice melts into water at exactly zero degrees Celsius. So if that outer chamber contains a mixture of both water and ice, it should always be the same temperature, zero degrees. That means that even if the temperature in the room goes up and down, the outer chamber will stay at zero, and that'll insulate the inner chambers from sudden changes in the room temperature. The middle chamber was filled with ice, but it's the central chamber where the interesting stuff happens. Lavoisier would put a guinea pig in that chamber and then put on the lid. The body heat of the guinea pig would warm up the ice in the middle chamber so that some of it would melt. After a certain period of time, they would take the guinea pig out and put it back in its home, and they'd drain out the water from the melted ice in the middle chamber. The higher the guinea pig's metabolism, the more body heat it would produce, and therefore the more ice would melt. In the next part of the experiment, Lavoisier would feed the guinea pig some livestock feed, and then put it back in the calorimeter again, and determine how much ice would melt. In this way, he could compare the amount of ice that would melt for each type of livestock feed that the guinea pig could eat. They predicted that when more ice melted, that meant that the feed that the guinea pig ate must have given it more metabolic energy. Today we know a lot more about how metabolism works, and we would now say that this experiment really isn't the best way to determine the energy content of food. Still, this was a pretty well-designed experiment based on what they knew about biology and chemistry at the time. Before we use what Lavoisier and Laplace discovered, this is a good time to mention the brave little guinea pigs that helped out in this experiment. In this case, none of those guinea pigs were killed during the research, and the only harm they suffered was being stuck in that chilly calorimeter for a while. But of course, some medical and scientific research does involve animals, and sometimes the animals do die, especially in the course of medical research into new disease treatments or the safety of pharmaceuticals. If you ever become a research scientist, it's important to think carefully about issues of animal welfare and research ethics. Different people have different opinions on whether new disease treatments that might save many human lives justify harming animals during the research that led to those treatments. I hope you'll have an opportunity to take a course in scientific ethics, because whatever your opinion on animal research, it's important to understand and think through issues like these. So back to the calorimetry. In experiments where the pressure is constant, the change in enthalpy is the same as the change in heat. The research of Lavoisier and Laplace eventually led them to realize that if you want to know how much energy it takes to heat an object, there are really only three things that matter. So for instance, suppose you wanted to heat a block of metal. The first thing that matters is the mass. This makes sense. If you had a 10 gram piece of metal and a 5 gram piece of the same metal, it would take twice as much heat to warm up the 10 gram piece because there's twice as much of the metal. The second thing to consider is what exactly the object is made of. Imagine that you're cooking soup and you had a big pot of it on your stove. You left the stirring spoon in the boiling water for several minutes. 
would you be afraid to grab the spoon and start stirring it? Chances are it would depend on what the spoon is made of. If it's a copper spoon, you might not want to touch it with your bare hands because you know the spoon is likely to be very hot. But if it were a wooden spoon, you might feel it's safe to grab it. And you'd be right. It's easier to heat up some materials than it is to heat up others. In comparison to copper, wood is very difficult to heat to a high temperature. This property is called the specific heat capacity, which has the symbol C. Here's a table of the specific heat capacities of several different materials. As you can see, most metals have a very low specific heat capacity. That means it doesn't take much energy to cause them to become hot. On the other hand, materials like wood, plastic, and water have much higher specific heat capacities, which means it takes a lot of energy to raise their temperature. That's why you feel safe touching the wooden spoon. Even if you've never heard of specific heat capacity, you know from experience that a wooden spoon is unlikely to be too hot to touch. This also explains why it usually takes a long time to boil water. As you can see, water has an unusually high specific heat capacity. There really aren't very many common liquids that have a specific heat capacity as high as that of water. That makes water especially difficult to heat. It's also one reason why cities that are near the ocean tend to have milder winters and summers. It takes a long time for the temperature of the ocean water to change from one season to the next, and that helps stabilize the temperature in the whole area. Before we move on, notice the units of the specific heat capacity. Joules per gram degrees Celsius. That means that, for example, it takes 0.412 joules of heat to raise the temperature of one gram of iron by one degree Celsius. In comparison, it only takes 0.129 joules of heat to raise the temperature of a gram of lead by one degree. So, if we start heating both of them at the same time, the lead will get hotter faster. The last thing that matters when determining how much heat it takes to warm an object is how much we want the temperature to change. That makes good sense. If we want to change the temperature by 10 degrees, it'll take twice as much heat than if we only want to change the temperature by 5 degrees. So to sum up, the change in enthalpy when we heat or cool an object will depend on the mass, the specific heat capacity, and the change in the temperature. And here's an equation that sums all that up. Notice that we need to be careful with our units. The specific heat capacity is measured in joules per gram degrees Celsius. And the enthalpy is measured in units of joules. In order for the units to work out, the mass must be measured in grams, and the temperature change needs to be in Celsius. Let's use this equation to try to solve a few problems. Suppose we have a 50 gram sample of water at 25 degrees Celsius. If we add 10.0 kilojoules of heat, what will be the final temperature of the water? We'll use the equation that we just looked at for this problem. We're trying to find out the final temperature, so we'll need to find delta T. That means we need to know delta H, M, and C. Delta H is the change in the enthalpy. So that's 10.0 kilojoules. Don't forget that we need the units to work out, so we need delta H to be in joules. A kilojoule is 1,000 joules, so in this example we have 10,000 joules. The mass is 50.0 grams. To get the specific heat capacity, we need to look at that table that we saw earlier. This tells us that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.181 joules per gram degrees Celsius. When we put these values into the equation and solve for delta T, we get 47.8 degrees. However, notice that's not our final answer. The question asked what the final temperature is, but what we just found was delta T, the change in temperature. Our water started at 25.0 degrees, and we just found out that the temperature change was 
So the final temperature will be 72.8 degrees C. Let's try another problem. Suppose we have a 5.00 gram piece of metal at 25.0 degrees C. We add 100 joules of heat and find that the temperature increases to 77.0 degrees. What kind of metal is it? This problem shows us one way that we could identify an unknown metal. Every metal has a different ability to absorb heat. You might remember that's what the specific heat capacity is telling us. So we'll use our equation again, and this time we want to solve for the specific heat capacity. We know that we added 100 joules of heat, so that's delta H. And we know that the mass is 5.00 grams. Our temperature went from 25.0 to 77.0 degrees. So delta T is 52.0 degrees Celsius. If we now solve for the specific heat capacity, we find that it's 0 0.385 joules per gram degrees C. If we look at our table of specific heat capacities, we'll find out that this metal is probably copper. I should mention that I don't expect you to memorize this table of specific heat capacities. I'll give you this data when you need it on a test or a quiz, and our textbook also has it if you need it for homework problems. So, now we've got a pretty good idea of how to determine the heat released during a reaction. Let's tie that back to the work performed, which we discussed during the last video. As I mentioned in that video, the overall change in the energy of a system is due to both the heat and the work. When the energy of a system changes, it must be because it exchanged heat or work with the surroundings. This is one way of expressing what's known as the first law of thermodynamics. We can express the first law using this equation. Very often, we'll be interested in infinitesimally small changes in the heat or work, so we can also write this equation this way. This is also a form of the law of conservation of energy. When the system gains or loses energy, it means that the energy of the surroundings went down or up by an equivalent amount, in the form of work or heat. So, now let's look a little more closely at the heat and work, and think about what happens when one of these things changes. It's easiest to think about changes to the heat or work if we hold one of the properties of the system constant. Usually, the property we'll hold constant will be the temperature, the volume, or the pressure. Since we're interested in the heat right now, we won't hold the temperature constant. After all, heat involves a transfer of energy due to a difference in temperature between the system and the surroundings. So instead, we'll hold either the volume or the pressure constant. First, let's think about what happens if the volume is constant. In order for that to happen, the system needs to be contained inside something with rigid walls so that the volume can't change. That's exactly what we do in a bomb calorimetry experiment, which is something you'll probably be doing in your lab course very soon. Remember, the work is equal to the negative of the external pressure times the change in volume. Since in this case we're holding the volume constant, that means the work must be equal to zero. So, when the volume is constant, the change in energy is just equal to the heat exchange with the surroundings. We can put a little V subscript next to the heat to remind us that the volume is constant. Unfortunately, it's actually pretty rare that we have a process that happens at constant volume. Except for bomb calorimetry experiments, such processes are very unusual. Instead, we usually perform experiments in an open container like a beaker or a flask. In that case, the volume of the system can easily change. Instead, what's constant is the pressure, because the container is open to the room, so the pressure is constant and is just equal to the pressure in the room. However, unlike the case when we had a constant volume, the energy is not equal to the heat when pressure is constant. Instead, we still have to include the work, because the volume is not constant, so the work will not be equal to zero. In this case, the pressure is constant, so we'll put a subscript P on the heat. The heat exchange under conditions of constant pressure has a special name, the enthalpy, and it has its own symbol, which is delta H. 
You probably remember talking about the enthalpy in other classes going right back to general chemistry, and you may have thought the enthalpy is synonymous with heat. However, now we can see that the enthalpy is only equal to the heat under conditions of constant pressure. If the pressure varies, delta H won't be equal to the heat. We'll see how to calculate the heat under conditions of varying pressure in a future video. One other thing. Sometimes it's convenient to use molar quantities of these properties. If we do that, we can rewrite the equation slightly. You might recall from an earlier video that the bar above a quantity means that it's a molar quantity. So here we have the energy, enthalpy, and volume per mole. Let's use this equation. Suppose we boil away 100 milliliters of liquid water at a constant pressure of 0.985 atmospheres. The gas produced fills a volume of 172.61 liters, and the molar enthalpy of the process is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. What's the change in molar energy? We actually have all we need in order to answer this question. Delta H bar is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. In order to make the units work out, we'll write that as joules per mole. The pressure is 0.985 atmospheres, and we need to convert that into appropriate units too. In this case, that means we need pascals. You might recall from previous videos that an atmosphere is 101,325 pascals, so that gives us this as our pressure. What about the change in molar volume? That one's a little trickier. We know the volume at the beginning and at the end, and we can see that the change in volume is 172.51 liters. But how many moles are there? To find out, we just need to remember that liquid water has a density of about 1.00 grams per milliliter. We had 100 milliliters, so that's 100 grams. And using the periodic table, we can convert that to moles. When we do, we find out that we have 5.55 moles of water. That gives us a delta V bar of 31.08 liters per mole. To make the units work out, we'll convert that to meters cubed per mole, which gives us 0 0.03108 meters cubed per mole. When we plug that into our equation, we get a result of 37,000 598 joules per mole, or 37.598 kilojoules per mole, for the change in energy. Notice that this is a positive number, which means that the system absorbed energy. That makes sense, because it certainly requires energy in order to cause water to boil. Sometimes, what we really want to calculate is the enthalpy change that occurs during a reaction, not the energy. In that case, we can rewrite this equation to put the enthalpy on the left side of the equation, which gives us this. If the process we're studying involves ideal gases, we can rewrite P delta V as RT delta N, where the delta N involves only the change in the moles of the gases in our reaction. You'll use this equation when you perform a bomb calorimetry experiment. There's one last thing I want to mention before we wrap up for today. At the end of video 14, we talked about the heat capacity, and we saw this equation, which tells us that the constant volume heat capacity is defined as the change in energy with respect to temperature at constant volume. This is because the heat capacity, by definition, is the change in heat as we change the temperature. At constant volume, the change in energy is equivalent to the heat change. For the same reason, there's also a constant pressure heat capacity, which has a similar definition. Just as the heat is equal to the change in energy at constant volume, it's equal to the change in enthalpy at constant pressure. So there are actually two different kinds of heat capacity. When you read a journal article or write a report, it's important to know which type of heat capacity you're working with. Although CV and CP have very similar values for solids and liquids, they can be very different for gases. And as you might expect, these two forms of heat capacity are related to each other. For an ideal gas, it turns out that the following equation is true. 
Cp minus Cv is just equal to n, the number of moles of gas, times r. If we're dealing with molar quantities, we divide through by the number of moles, which makes the equation even simpler. So this tells us that for an ideal gas, the constant pressure and constant volume heat capacities are different by 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll explore the implications of the fact that work and heat are path functions. It has some surprising consequences. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.